Welcome to episode 11 of the Photomind Talks podcast. Thanks so much for joining us again here, or if it's your first time, thanks for joining us for the first time. Uh, we have a very special guest, as we always do. Today, we have Lisa Listen. She is a genealogist and the founder of Are You My Cousins YouTube page and blog. And she has a ton of awesome things to say about genealogy. And even before we started, she's already gotten going on her own family's history and photos. And I know she's going to be a great guest today. So thanks so much for being here, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Matthew. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, I'm very glad that you're here because, uh, you know, we, uh, photo mine and you, we kind of met at Roots Tech this year, I know, and kind of connected and done a little, a couple things since then. But, uh, you know, obviously Roots Tech's the biggest uh, genealogy convention. And I'm curious how you got started with genealogy. Interestingly enough, so genealogy, I'm, I think in terms of the researchers that are out there, I'm kind of a new Newcomer in a sense. So when my children, who were now young adults, so when they were young, we had, you know, it was during the summertime, we are here in the southern US, which is very hot in August. And it was honestly too hot to go to the swimming pool. <laughs> That's how hot it was. So they wanted to do something inside and said, we want to Google ourselves. <laughs> so we started Googling our last name and we started finding names that we recognized and other people's names and new cousins and it just took off from there essentially um so it's been a lot of fun i quickly left them in the dust but every now and then i'll, I'll throw them throw out a you know oh look who we're related to or look we come from you know we have family who came from this country or they think that's really cool mostly they want to know if we're related to anybody famous and the answer is really no <laughs> not yet <laughs> Well, hopefully soon, right? That's what the next generations are for is uh, <laughs> is getting the name on the board next time that bring that's that right. Google search up. Uh, no, that's really cool. Uh, that's such an interesting and such a like new new world, digital world type of way to uh, just like dive in that all of a sudden after just a Google search to that's so that's so interesting. Have you Google searched yourself before then? Um, not before then. I hadn't. No, we um. I'm a, we didn't really, it was really kind of getting new and exciting at that point with Google and things like that. I mean, this was back when, um, you know, we really, people were just really starting to get com home computers, basically. So we weren't doing as much at that time. So, yeah. But even though you weren't searching yourself, were, were you always interested in family history or your own family history, at least? I, I think, I don't, I think it was really very subtle and in, in the background. So I grew up and a large extended family. I knew all of my grandparents. I knew some of my great grandparents. You know, we would, both sides of the family had a yearly, either a Christmas family get together every year or, you know, Thanksgiving get together. So I was around a lot of the older generations in my family. I didn't necessarily seek out the stories. I remember hearing stories. What fascinated me was there were like, ancestors or, or relatives in the family with unusual names. And so that would fascinate me. Um, you know, like there was um, an aunt, but her name was Clyde, you know, and it was kind of like, what Clyde, why is Clyde? A, that's a man's name. And, and, you know, they're like, no, no, not then it wasn't. And then, you know, my great grandfather's name was Connie, which to me would be a woman's name, which for him was not obviously and so you know those kinds of things would pique my interest so I would I was kind of in the background with it I would hear it I would hear those stories and it would um that those stories come back came back to me certainly as I started researching in earnest so I was kind of surrounded by it but not necessarily actively researching it at that time that's so interesting and now I imagine it's not the same now you're no. knee deep in it knee deep in it and if there's an if there's a relative out there I'm just I'm on the phone I snail mail I am actively seeking to um to talk to all the, the older generations certainly as well as the younger generations too but really trying to seek out those um more distant cousins I, nobody's safe from me from when it comes from family or oral history <laughs> and family gathering stories <laughs> that's too funny how um I guess I've 
you know, with my experience of speaking with genealogists, it seems like there's kind of two pools of gene genealogists, some that just specifically focus on their own family's history and some that while they focus on their own, but they also are there to kind of help people dig into their own. And obviously with your website, you have tons of tips on how people can do so. Um, but as far as, you know, the work you do with your site and your blog, et cetera, are you also helping people directly or is it more just kind of through videos and tips? I do a lot through videos and tips because I have, I think, over almost about 300 blog posts now over on the website. But I do also do some limited one on one where I will actually either work with somebody and, and more of almost a coaching where we will research side by side type of, of thing. Or I will occasionally just take clients out. They'll give me their tasks that they want me to do. And sometimes it's because they just need another eye on their research because a fresh eye is very helpful. Um, one of the things that I I enjoy doing and kind of have in, put more into my research is looking beyond the online databases. And that's something, you know, I'm, I'm very good at researching, say, through special collections and seeking down those like little newspaper runs that were only maybe one or two years. But, you know, that's that's the one or two years in the location your ancestor lived in. That's the one I'm going after. So those are the types of things that um, I help people do and either teach them how to find those things or I'll just go look for, I'll be tasked to go find those myself. What's the biggest difference, I guess, as far as, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the biggest difference between how, you know, how you go about approaching somebody else's genealogy versus how uh, searching your own? To be honest, I don't know that it's, there's a, a tremendous difference. I sometimes I forget I find myself as I get immersed in a client's research, I just, honestly, I forget that I'm actually not related to that. I get very invested into that research project. And I realize, you know, sometimes I have to wait, oh, wait, I'm not even related to this person or this line, but I'm just very invested in, in finding those, either finding the facts or the stories, solving that mystery. It's, it's just, once I'm in it, there's not a lot of difference between how I approach that and how I would approach my own. That's so cool. Is there anything you've discovered in your own family's history based on maybe something that you learned from a client? Um, what I find is, um, I'd say you don't believe everything you read or hear from your ancestors, from your relatives. <laughs> this is probably <laughs> one of the things that stories that I had come up with early. This was early in my research. I learned a very valuable lesson to, to it. And I've actually been able to share this with clients as well as just readers on the, on the website about things is that I had been, I was new into it. I was researching my mother's um, line and I'm very easy, what I would consider an easy name, Howard. I mean, that's a very common name here. And so I was researching that but I got stuck and I couldn't find my a great great grandfather and I couldn't find him couldn't find him. finally I found the family and the name was Harwood so H A R W A R D not Howard and then I discover it wasn't just a blip on the record I'm finding generation after generation going back that's the name they're using so I'm like whoa look we had a name change in the family I call my mom I'm like guess what I've discovered that we had that Howards actually were also Harwoods, that it's the name change. And she went, oh, we didn't tell you that. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? They had the answer. The answer was in my, was within the family history. This was common knowledge, just a generation above me, but I didn't know that. And that was really um, drove home the point for me that I have to, I have to reach out to the family. I have to talk to the cousins. I have to talk to anybody who will, who will give me stories because the answers oftentimes are there and I think we make it harder for ourselves in our own personal research if we're not utilizing the family members that are out there and who can talk to you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting, though, that like, I imagine your family knows that you're you're passionate about genealogy. So that for such a, I, I mean, such an interesting family fact to kind of just not be mentioned and then be like, oh, of course, how did you not know that? Seems like a, seems like such a goofy way for family members to kind of not necessarily hide their past, but to just kind mm -hmm. of not, it's just, it just kind of is, that's all, it's part of the history and you kind of move forward. And if you know it, you know, it, and if you don't, your people are surprised, like, why were you never informed of this? Exactly. I, actually, I discovered somebody who, it turned out to be a half, my, my grandfather's half sister, completely 
um, it scared me to death when I was new into research. I'm seeing this person. She's got all the family history. She's reaching out. She's saying, you know, I'm, I'm so-and-so's half sister. And I'm like, whoa. So I immediately, I was like, I'm not touching this. I'm not touching this. So I picked up the phone. I called my mom and she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we know her. I'm like, she goes, I used to play with her as a kid. I'm like, wait, what? And, and she's like, and it was one of those things. There was, had been a divorce in the family. The mother had taken the child and they'd moved away. And there was no secret at all. It was simply, she just wasn't part of the family. It hadn't been part of the family gatherings as much because she, her mother had taken her away. And so there was no family secret. So it was really nice to be able to bring that story kind of to a conclusion within my own generation and share that with my generation of cousins and everybody was like really and so it, it was a really it was a it was a fun thing to be able to, to do that and to you know there was no family drama around it obviously um so and I did have contact with her after that so that was a really nice way of kind of bringing that family story to conclusion well, that's so nice um well it's interesting it's it's Every time I, I do these type of interviews with genealogists, especially, it's so interesting to hear how everyone's stories are very similar, but different in the, in like the perfect mm -hmm. ways that makes everyone unique and their stories unique. Um, but one thing I always bring up while doing, especially when doing these interviews with genealogists is uh, at phone of mine, we talk about family anchors. Um, and I brought it up on the podcast tons of times that we talk about this idea of like a family anchor, the person that it seemingly seems like every family has that one person who is always in charge of the family's history. And then it kind of gets that role kind of gets passed. It doesn't need to go every generation, but at some point, whether it skips mm -hmm. a generation or not, or maybe takes like a sidestep to somebody um, there's always somebody kind of in charge of everything. And I guess before you kind of took this leap and Googled yourself, was there, any, was there somebody in the family who had that role before you? I would say on, on my maternal side, my mother's side, there was an aunt who did a lot of genealogy research. In fact, I, I actually, her, her daughters sent me her files afterwards. Um, and But again, it was one of those, I knew she did it. I would hear the stories and she did it. She did it before computers, before the online stuff. So she, I, my hat was off to her. She did a tremendous amount of work. And so she had that. And so I really drew a lot on her notes. Um, a lot of the, the records I could rec recreate, but I was really interested in the notes about, you know, adoptions that might've occurred within the family because I wouldn't necessarily have a way to know that that's what that, you know, how that child suddenly appeared. I wouldn't necessarily know that relationship. So there were things like that that she would put in there that were very helpful. On the other side of the family, basically there was a trunk um, the great, my father's grandmother died when she was very, very young, leaving young children and everything went of hers went into the, my dad calls it the sacred trunk. It was this mystery trunk. They were not allowed to talk about it. They were not allowed to touch it. And fast forward 50 years and that trunk came out of the Virginia tobacco barn and was opened. And as we were cleaning out properties and Fortunately, it all came to me. <laughs> so I've documented everything and it was hundreds of letters, personal letters. So you just never quite know what you're going to find in those kinds of things. So it was a lot of the family history just sat in a barn for 50 years or more. Wow. It's interesting with letters also, I imagine, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I imagine them, a lot of those letters are um, like, are they, are they, I guess, are they love letters or are they kind of more just like here, we're catching up on life kind of letters? I'd say a little bit of both, mostly a catching up on life. Most of them, they were my great grandmothers. She was a, a young woman in say the 1910s. And it was, she had a lot of friends. She was a prolific letter writer. The Brownie camera was coming, had just been introduced. So they, they, they were sending photographs back and forth because it was for the first time really accessible to the public and affordable to the public. So they were able to take photographs back and forth, but she was a prolific letter writer, not only to her cousins, but to her friends as well. And so I have a lot of the letters that were sent to her. And so I can follow that trail, but she was apparently quite popular with the boys. She had a lot of suitors and I've been able to kind of track those guys down and even using draft records, determining what they looked like. And she ultimately chose the tall lanky farmer. Who was my <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. 
Well, I ask the reason I ask about the the form of the letters is, um, like I mentioned, we, we, uh, we went through my grandmother's house, and I found this box of letters. My grandfather had passed away um, two decades ago, about, and uh, there was a box in the basement of these letters, and it was on this paper that I've never felt paper so thin. It felt like tracing paper almost. But the paper was not only was the letter, it was also like the envelope. So you had the stamp on the outside, it closed, it kind of sealed. Um, but my grandfather had saved all of these letters and there were letters between him, either him and his father or him and his brother mostly. Um, and there were letters from after my grandfather had emigrated from New York, uh, from Israel to the US. So all the letters were written in Hebrew to his brother and to, in Yiddish to his father, which I found was like really, really fascinating. And the, the thing I thought was most fascinating when I had my friends help me translate the letters, uh, the ones in Hebrew, at least, uh, it, like to see how just everyday things were in the, like, it was things like, oh, well, I went to the bank today and I got in a yelling match with the teller or uh, one of the most, in, one of the most interesting things I thought was um, my great uncle describing how he, um, how he was thinking about changing his name to, he was thinking about changing his mm -hmm. name to fit in a little bit better with, uh, with his community. Um, and like, he, then he was choosing between two names and he like wrote the two names and like, I see the other one. I was like, Oh, I, that's the name he chose. I, I know this name. This is like how he went, you know, when, when I eventually met him at a part of my life. But um, so I was like curious to see how these letters are everything from like major life, mo life moments and family moments to, just the simplest thing. Like we went on a plane yesterday. It was my daughter's first time. Um, and I think that's like the power of, like you say, like, especially a prolific letter writer is that you get that mundaneness that what are you going to do? Like go through your text messages from 20 years ago. I mean, uh, probably not. Right. Like that's the equivalent, I guess. Of, I, I'm kind of, yeah. It's sort of like a reality TV, but ancestor style basically, because you read exactly what they were, you know, and sometimes it, um, you just never know what you're going to find. And, you know, she, again, was very prolific. Her cousins were prolific, prolific, a lot of postcards. And for whatever reason, it was, the weather was almost always included <laughs> yeah, about what the weather was happening. So I have a really good idea of what the weather was like. But, the, but again, that may speak to the fact that they were rural farmers. Weather was right. important part of their life. And so that was, that was an important piece of it as well. But yeah, it, it was a, it was a lot of fun to to go through those, and I periodically pull them out and read them. I had put them all in order of date, and just to to get that sense of what was the story of her life because she died so young. There, nobody living today remembers knew her personally, and so we only have the stories, and this is the only way we know um, this great grandmother. That's awesome. All right. So, well, uh, I now, you know, I have a good idea of your background as a genealogist and your family history a little bit. Um, but I'm curious, I guess, kind of when you switch, right? So you do this Google search, you gets you interested in genealogy, your family's history. What was it, I guess, where you made this switch, this flip from now I'm interested in my family's history, but here I want to actually make it into something very active. Um, and whether that means whether that means posting tips for people, videos, creating this blog, like how how did you kind of decide to move forward with this into something beyond just like a, a pet project? Right. I'd say that was probably around 15 years ago or so. I but I was I had started a blog because many of my my relatives, they knew I was you know very interested. I was actively researching our own family and trying to keep up with telling people what I was finding. And so I was, I created the blog as a way to, to really, it was a family blog. It was a way to share what I was finding. I would write up stories about different ancestors. And so it was a central place for people to come. And then I started to realize that more people than my mother and my aunts were reading it. So I thought maybe I'm onto something here. <laughs> And people actually would start to reach out to me and say, well, how did you find this out? Or how did you do this? And um, about that time is when I started attending genealogy conferences. And so I was like, hey, I think I can do that. I can do this. And I want to show people how to do this because I do have, I enjoy, I enjoy teaching. I am, 
my previous career was a physical therapist, which is actually has a lot of teaching. I did a lot, you know, instruction and teaching and movement and analysis. And so those were skills that really moved quite well into genealogy research and uh, analyzing the problem and then being able to teach people how to go step by step to achieve their goals. So that was sort of the flip. It was a little, that sounds really quick. It actually was, it took a little while to get there, get through that, but um, that's really how I started with it. That's great. So why don't you tell us about, are you my cousin? Like, really, I want to hear everything about it. Oh, everything about it. So are you my cousin? It, the, actually, the name, the name comes from me attending a wedding, a cousin's wedding. And it was wonderful. I had, you know, down on fam in the family church or family church, the church where the family attended for generations. And so as I would go through the reception, I was related to probably 90% of the people who were there in some form or fashion, but I didn't necessarily know. It. And I was like, are you my cousin? Are you my cousin? You know, kind of like that little, there's a book, a children's book about, are you my mother? The little duckling, the, right, the right. gosling who's trying to ask the little ducks to find his, his mother. And that's how, are you my cousin got its name. So that's where that came from was always me asking, are you my cousin? Are you my cousin? And so it is blog posts. I've written tons of blog posts over there. Um, and I continue to go back and actually update them as new things come around and go with that. And then I became an accidental YouTuber. Um, <laughs> so with it, um, I dabbled in video a little bit early on where I would, and I just put, YouTube was the parking place for the videos. And so then I, a few years ago, I realized people are actually watching those videos over on YouTube. And so it was just another way to reach a different audience who prefers to see what I do. Some people prefer to read the written word of it. Some people prefer to actually hear it. They're, they're more auditory and prefer to view the video that way. And so I just combined the two to put that. But I really like to talk about things such as you know, how to do it in a frugal way. That does not always mean free. It means frugal, making best use of our dollars, because a lot of us are trying to obviously be mindful of our genealogy dollars because, you know, DNA tests add up. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> then, so I would teach how to do that, but also how to analyze a document, how to analyze census records. I think that's one of the um, records that people overlook some of the stories that are there. It's very quick, easy to grab your ancestor and your family and to go back another generation, but not really, but you're not really necessarily always getting everything out of that census record that could be helpful. So I like to teach people how to do that. I also like to teach people how to think what I call outside of the box. So get outside of the the census records, the wills, the probates, the land records that we're used to, what other types of records could have could an ancestor have created? And specifically I have a, a passion for finding female ancestors. That's one of the things I, I actually even created. I have an e-course on that as well because they have their own set of challenges when it comes to researching those female ancestors and getting the lines back. And we have to step outside of our comfort zone when it comes to research. And we have to get into that community and literally rebuild the that ancestor's life because she may be what we consider quiet in the records, she wasn't quiet. She was living a full life out there in that community. So we have to understand who she was and what her passions were and what her causes were to really be able to fill out her life to then go back another generation and to hopefully continue that one back. Um, oh, can you tell? I'm a little passionate about researching um, the women in the family tree <laughs> <laughs> because we can't we can do it. Yes, we can do it. That's it should be. So there's, a, and then of course, certainly photographs have been something. Um, I talk a lot about photographs on the website as well, because I did, I am very, very fortunate. I inherited hundreds of photographs as older, as older aunts and uncles passed away and they would filter their way down to me because people would say, we know we, we, they're important. We don't know who they are, but we don't want to, we recognize we don't want to get rid of them out of the family but we don't want to store them anymore. And so that's how I receive a lot of my photographs as well. So then I get to work on trying to identify them and find the stories. And I don't, I still have a, a good number that are not identified as, as yet, but I have hopes and plans to get them all identified eventually. <laughs> that's awesome. So do you have any interesting stories about the research you've done? Really anything you found along the way that made you chuckle, made you say, ooh, that was interesting. Anything of that sort? Oh, yeah. 
um, I was actually, my dad, my dad went with me. He is, um, we went up a few years ago to the county courthouse where most of his family was from. And so I was digging into the records and, and I found, came across accidentally, because this was not what I was looking for, but I came across a record where my fourth great grandparents were indicted by the grand jury for living in adultery. And this was in 1848. Now, the interesting thing is they've been together since and having children since 1828. So for 20 years, I don't know what happened in 1848 that, that this, record, but you can imagine that that sent us on a, a search. And so I was like, okay, I need to find out more about this couple. What's going on? And I'll fast forward to the end of that story. As it turns out, they never married. Now, I mean, that's not all, all, all that unusual and not really shocking in today's generation. You know, that's, but for the 1820s and the 1840s, that's, that's a big deal. It's that prison. is a really big deal. It, it was amazing. <laughs> and so as I dug into it, what I found out was, was she didn't want to marry him because um, he had a gambling problem. And she had um, some money and some property from her first marriage, and um, she didn't want to trust him with it. And so it, apparently they were in love and they had a, a lot of children, and um, but they didn't get married because she didn't want him to have, because if when she did, he would automatically have rights to all of her, her property and everything became his at that time period. So she's like, wow. no, nope, not marrying you. And, you know, I found all this out in her estate records and the depositions that were occurring from the children trying to get their inheritance because, and then, then he was declared insane. And I mean, just all these things that were coming out, this was not, they may have been in love, but this was not necessarily a by the book couple. This was not a couple that played by the rules necessarily. <laughs> and so, um, Yes. Um, and then he eventually, um, I was then went on to discover after she passed away, he eventually um, passed away and was listed on the paupers list um, for that year. So he came from a very well moneyed family and basically lost everything. Oh, wow. So it was a really fascinating story to kind of put their pieces together um, and find out about what happened on that lawn. This is kind of a classic almost the black sheep story of the family families that have a black sheep they tend to be well documented and so <laughs> they're fun to they're fun to research what what do you mean by that what, how are they well documented because they end up in court more more frequently oh, so that makes not sense. only did not only was her estate an issue and and they had to the children had to go after the father to get some of the make sure they had the land sorted out the there were multiple depositions stating it was very, very common knowledge that she did not marry him. She would not marry him. They, but they named some extra children. I found some extra children that were, um, that had moved out of the area. So that was nice to have another avenue to research there. But they also were, the as a couple, they were actually sued by merchants for not paying their bills and that type of thing. So it was a really interesting, there were money issues around due to his gambling issues and because he also came from a well-off family there were other issues involved with that they ended up in the court system and when families end up in the court systems they tend to air their dirty laundry it makes for a fascinating reading i think it's every bit as fascinating when you read that stuff compared to reality tv because they will air that dirty laundry and you have a personal connection to it which makes it just as entertaining personally to uh reality tv Yes. And if you want to get the younger generations interested, you know, my young adult children, when you drop stories about nuggets about these types of stories, then they sit up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I was actually going to ask you what tips do you have for others looking to deep dive into their own family history? But it seems like the first tip might be have an interesting story for them to get into, at least for younger generations really, of your own kids, right? It really does help because a lot of times, you know, I'll talk genealogy and family history to people and you, know, you get this kind of glazed over blank stare look from the person you're talking to. Right. And the kids were like that. But when my son was young, younger, he was, I guess, probably middle school, elementary school or middle school. And it was Memorial Day here in the U.S. And he said, Mom, do we have anybody who fought in a war? 
um, do we have any soldiers in the family? And I said, well, yes, we do. Put your shoes on. We're going for on a field trip. And so I took him downtown in um, our county and I took him to this, this, it's a rock basically. It's a, with a plaque on it. And it's the original site of the Wake County, North Carolina um, uh, courthouse. And that is where soldiers, the Revolutionary War soldiers would, would muster out. They would go, they would meet their units and they would muster out and head off to war. And I let him see that. And I gave him the camera, let him take the photographs. I'm like, this is where your sixth great grandfather, you know, fought, you know, left with the Revolutionary War soldiers and his eyes were getting big. And then I turned him and I said, do you see that railroad track a block down this was a block, to, block away? And he said, yes. And I said, that's where your great great grandfather got hit by a train. And he's like, cool. <laughs> In fact, that was actually more exciting to him than the, the than this Revolutionary War soldier. And then he goes, did he live? And I said, yes. And be glad for that, honey. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, So just the, to be able to if you've got children, you're trying to engage them. That is a fabulous way. If you, if you have that opportunity to to go and see, um, I do tell people that pictures really are a great icebreaker, particularly when children oftentimes have these school projects where they're needing to talk to a family member. But maybe they're not comfortable with it. Maybe they're not. Maybe they don't see their their relatives that much, or maybe they're having to interview over Zoom as we have you know through the pandemic. If you have a picture that you can talk about that is a great icebreaker. And it can be an older picture. It can be, you know, it can be a picture of their soccer game, but just using a picture to, to kind of break that ice or to ask a question about is very helpful to get that storytelling going. And I think that's a great way to engage those younger generations. But I also think it's important for us as adults, as, as we age to write our own stories. And it doesn't have to be a long flowery prose. It can be my grandfather, 12 pages in a steno stenographer's pad that he wrote later in his life. It's not long. It's not um, everything he ever did, but it, he, he had some things he wanted to say. And so he, he told the story of who his parents were and, and what his mother was like and those types of things. So it was a really important piece of the family history to do as well. That's so nice. What do you think people can gain from researching their families that maybe, you know, especially with people who maybe never thought of doing it at all in the uh, in the past, but what, what do you think that they can gain from doing so if they haven't already? I think there are two things that really came to mind that come to mind on this question. And one is just perspective on a family member and just having that perspective on a what maybe your parents or your grandparents go back studies have been done about the resilience that of children after trauma and that if they have a sense of connectedness to a generation or past generations they tend to do recover quick more quickly they tend to recover their you know like in school and grades and things like that i think ultimately people are really looking for connection many people who get into family history they're looking for some type of connection and I think through the pandemic, I think we were seeing a lot of that. First of all, people had a lot more time on their hands at home. And but also I think people were looking to connect more. And I think that that's kind of at the heart of it is being able to be connected and understand those stories. There's an innate, I think, need that sometimes people want to have that. But the perspective piece of it was very much illustrated to me. And I had a woman reach out to me years ago and she said, oh, we're cousins, we're related. Um, your, her grandmother and my great, great grandmother were sisters. And I said, oh, wow. I said, wait, I said, I have a photo. I have a, a letter that your, your grandmother wrote in her handwriting to her sister in my closet. So I scanned it and sent it off to her. And it was a, it was a heartbreaking letter, actually. She was writing her sister to tell her sister about the death of her husband and how crushed she was. This was um, not a natural death. This was, um, he was a re revenue. This was, um, this was a murder. And she was heartbroken and pouring out her heart to her sister. And so when my newfound cousin read that letter, she said, she told me, she said, I knew my grandmother. I grew up with her. She lived with us. She was not your nice, cuddly grandmother who made cookies. She was very prickly. She said, I was scared of her. I didn't have a lot of good feelings. And she said, I've done a 180. I, she said, I cried when I read this because all of a sudden I realized 
her heartbreak and what she had gone through and what she felt. And my sister and I now only wish we had known this years ago when she was living so we could have had that relationship. And that really, I think it's that perspective that can be gained even, you know, even years later to have that perspective on what that family was like. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's, that's difficult to hear, but it's nice to know that it comes from a place of like interest and, you know, help finding that perspective, as you said, being able to understand your family and your history and really Mm -hmm. understand, like really understand people deeply um, is what it comes down to. It's not just being able to plot a tree or anything like that, that you can actually get to know these people through research is really, uh, I mean, it's impressive that you can do so, especially when you go back generations, but um, Mm -hmm. it's a good way to, I don't know, feel like, I don't even know the word I'm looking for. It's kind of like putting the, putting the pieces of yourself together, honestly. Right. Because you're kind of, you're always in some capacity um, informed by the people, you know, your family before you in some way. Um, So to get the, the more pieces you have, the better. I mean, you've answered all my questions. Any any last thoughts? Any last words? Any last plugs? Anything? Any last plugs? I think just jump into it. If you haven't started your research in family history, jump into it. It's it's a fascinating um, project. You There are so many online resources these days. You can educate yourself, certainly, through many, many outlets. There's a number of genealogy YouTubers. I'm over on YouTube. Um, I have, like I said, blog posts out there that are out there. All the major genealogy databases have tutorials on their sites as well. So you can certainly have a chance to, to educate yourself, but don't, oh, please don't overlook talking to your family. <laughs> Talk to the family while you still can to get those stories, to get you started. Yeah, I think the family, would just, they just want you to talk to them anyways, but uh, also, yeah, yeah, also anyway. your past. just talk to them anyways. <laughs> Um, you yeah. can catch, you can catch Lisa on her website, Lisa listen.com. Correct. Right. And also correct. on her, on her YouTube page, are you my cousin? Um, such mm-hmm. a, it's such an awesome name. It's really, it's really funny. I'm so happy you told us the story of that. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, but, um, thanks so much for being with us today, Lisa. You were an awesome, awesome guest. Um, you have such, such, you have so much passion for genealogy and it's really great to hear. Um, so thanks so much for being with us today. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed talking talking genealogy once again. <laughs> once again. Well, that'll do it for episode 11 of Photomind Talks. Thanks so much again to Lisa. And we will be back soon enough with some more awesome podcasts for you. Thanks so much. Take care.